Good evening, everybody. It is a great pleasure to be here again, to see everybody online. We're so lucky to be able to do this. I'm thankful that I can do this. And Kwanjanam is here. Kwanjanam, thank you. Very sir. good to see you, sir. Thank you, sir. Come me down. Good evening, everybody. So, uh, can I have my papers? Excuse me. We made some adjustments here, everybody. Let me uh, let me just. Uh, Fix this. We're not quite uh, the big news agencies yet, but we're trying to make this as effective as possible for you. And so you can see us. Okay, Mr. Adams, I think we're set. Good. Very good. So thank again, you, everybody. Thank for your you, patience. everybody. Quantum, can I offer you a cup of tea? Thank you. Yes, indeed. Nice cold day and a nice cup of tea. Warm the heart. Thank you, sir. Come me there. May I spill one for you? Oh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Come me there. Chupe. Chupe. So, again, we are blessed to be able to talk to Quanjanim and ask questions. Um, and I'm hoping we have enough time to get to all of them. Uh, some very good questions here today. And Quanjin, I'd like to start, and it's almost a follow-on to just where we left last week. I got a question from Christine Marzano. Yes, sir. And she said that many times she has heard you talk about the teachers going around from place to place. And this is in old times, and we talked about that last week, doing forms along the way. And you said that it may take them a year, a full year, to do their rounds before they ever came back to that village again. And that the, the teaching was that little piece of, of a form or a technique that the master wanted them to practice all year long before they ever, before he came back to make sure that they really understood it. When he, want, he wanted to see results when, the, when he came back. That's how he knew that they were a willing and, and, and good student. Uh, maybe you can put that in better words. Um, and they would learn, every time he came, they would learn something new. And that was certainly a good thing. And then there's the question of, Back then, did they have a belt system the way we do today? And how did it work? Um, and how, was, how did the student advance? How did they know at what level they were? And it may be a different context today, but I thought you'd be a, it would be a great question for you to. Yeah, it certainly is. Thank you, Christine, for that question. It is a good one. Um, one has to remember when you're learning martial arts techniques, techniques, it's not just the quantity of the technique, but it's the depth of the technique that you learn as well. So in other words, uh, a student like Gichin Funakoshi would go to Anka Watosu or uh, Anka Wazado, who were their teachers in Okinawa, and they would teach them a form. Now the time would come when they would know the kata in its entirety for the physical motion. But then they would have to get down under the hood and start learning the practical or the bunkai, practical mm, application. Yes. So that would take time too, right? So there's different facets as far as the learning process goes. Now, as far as um, traveling from village to village, I had the good uh, uh, chance of interviewing Grandmaster Kim Bakman. And for those of you who don't know who uh, Grandmaster Kim Bakman is, he was one of General Che's uh, very close disciples who helped him create the tools or the forms of the ITF. Uh, he, was a, he is a very opinionated man. And uh, to some degree, I give him credit for that because he has a right to be in some ways. But the point is, uh, we had lunch uh, several times, and I was interviewing him. And uh, I was taping him at the time. And uh, I recall him telling me about the times when his teacher, uh, before, long before the Korean War, would, when, Jap when uh, Korea was annexed by, by Japan, 
the teacher would come from village to village to village to village throughout South Korea, you know, or at that time, Korea, not just South Korea. Korea was one nation. And um, because there were so many people who wanted to learn martial arts, but so few teachers, uh, they would have to wait for this teacher to return. And sometimes it would take, as I said last week, anywhere from several months to a year, right? So they would be given homework. The student would be given homework, right? And that homework could be something as simple as a jumping kick. It doesn't have to be a form, you know, although likely as time progressed it would turn into a form because that's what uh, was the prime method of passing on martial arts skills from master to disciple. First, the teacher would have to learn if the student was worthy of learning martial arts, right? So they would see after a few visits whether this person practiced or not. Right. If they just started at square one again, and every time they came, they would probably not come back again. Right. Mm. So it had to be uh, pro a progression of learning. Now, um, that routine was obvious true, obviously true for many teachers and many students. You know, you have to remember that Korea between 1910 and 19. Uh, uh, 45 was again occupied by Japan, and martial arts were pretty much forbidden, uh, except for kendo and judo, which were taught sporadically in different locations because they were Japanese martial arts. However, uh, to study martial arts alone was probably very secretive, so it had to be done clandestinely. You know, um, so there were no formalized dojangs. There was nothing like that. Nothing at all like. You would be practicing in the woods. You would be practicing by a waterfall or by a mountain with your, uh, with your back to the mountain because the mountain had a lot of positive energy. You know, uh, For those of you, again, who have been to Korea with us and visited the Blue House, which is their White House, you remember there's a very large mountain behind yes. it, and that's the way the architecture dictates. Um, so that's the way it would be taught, from village to village, master would travel to travel. Now, there was no belt system per se until the 1880s. And can anybody remember who was pretty much primarily responsible for the belt system? If you, if you attended any of my um, history and philosophy lectures, you'll know that we attribute the belt system to Jigoro Kano. And Jigoro Kano was the founder of uh, uh, Kodokan Judo, you know. Right. And the judo system was the first to really come with a formalized belt system in the 1880s. Uh, so uh, most of the time, belts weren't evident. You know, it was only when you came into formalized dojangs or, or, or uh, you know, Korean or Japanese training halls, uh, dojos, uh, would you see the formalized belts. And again, the story goes that in the olden days, there were only two belts. One would be the white belt, and one would be the black belt. And as time progressed, the, black, the white belt would grow darker with age, you know. Uh, but there had to be a way of distinguishing uh, students from various other students as far as their capabilities go. So the belt system came into effect. And again, we pretty much attribute that to Jigoro Kano. That's so if I could take you back to part of what you said there. Um, when did the dojangs actually happen? Was that after the Japanese were, were pushed out by the American army, or is it after World War I? When, when was that? You asked a good question, and the question was framed in an interesting way, because you used the specific term dojang, right? Now, uh, many martial artists, martial arts students, I should say, or wannabe martial arts students, uh, will come in and they'll uh, be interested in training and in their own innocent, naive way, they'll say, oh, this is a beautiful dojo. And my heart cringes when they say that because we know in Korean it's dojang, not dojo. You know, dojo is a, is a, uh, a Japanese phrase or a Okinawan phrase, you know. So in Okinawa there were formal schools and we're going back to the 1800s and the uh, late 1800s. Uh, and many people think that karate was uh, nurtured or born in Japan, and that's just not true. Hmm. Uh, in 1922, Gichin Funakochi, who was a young man in Okinawa, 
uh, whose family was part of the um, samurai, as a matter of fact, uh, began training in karate. But it wasn't known as karate then. It was known as tote, tote, oh. and uh, on Okinawa. And he sought out two very famous teachers at the time. One was Anku Azatu, and the other was Anku Atosu. Um, and what he would do is travel from his home between the two towns of Naha and Shuri and by the back roads, by the pine forests, right? And he would travel by night by a lantern. And when he was walking at night, because it had to be done clandestinely again, because the Japanese again occupied or, or made a, uh, a territory out of Okinawa, martial arts were forbidden, so they had to be practiced secretly. So he would travel these roads, and he would take in the smell of the pines, and he would love that smell. It would remind him later on in life of his young training. And he would go to his master's house, and it wasn't a dojo. It was nothing like it. It was a backyard where the teacher would sit on the balcony of his home, and he would watch uh, Gishin Funakoshi practice the forms that they would be teaching, the kata. Sometimes they would be nahanshi or teki, not teki yet because that's Japanese, but they would be nahanshi or nafanshi, which is our chulki forms. And according to his own autobiography, he would do these forms over and over and over again to the point of humiliation. Mm. All night long, the same form over and over again. I ask you, do you have patience to do that? I ask our students, do you have patience to do that? I doubt if in this day and age that would be prevalent, you know. So he would travel these roads, and then finally, as he got older, the Japanese came and visited and saw the benefits of the martial arts and wanted to bring it back to Japan to cause more nationalism. You've got to remember, this is 1922 now, just before the Second World War, and they were trying to build their young men to be strong warriors, soldiers. And so he began teaching in various locations in different schools. One day, he, to his surprise, his students, who, who multiplied greatly, came to, his, came to him and said, sir, we have something for you. And they had built him a dojo. And oh. a big sign on the front that said Shotokan. Ha. And the Shotokan means the school of the waving pines, the waving pines. Oh. So they were paying tribute to Gichin Funakochi right. uh, for bringing karate to Japan by naming his school something that brought him fond memories, which is his walks from Naha to Shuri in the pine forests of Okinawa, and thinking of the waving pines, you know? So here we had a formalized dojo, right? This was a formalized training school. And of course, many other training schools started popping up. Uh, I'm not sure about this, but it's likely that the Kodokan already had a presence there. The Kodokan is like the Kukiwan is in Korea. It was the center for judo the Kodokan. Um, and then you had the Shotokan for uh, karate. And that's where Gichin Funakoshi started calling the art karate, do, the way of the empty hand. Uh, as far as dojangs go, which was your original question, one has to remember that um, the Korean War, which started uh, in August of 1950, uh, demolished Korea. And before that, and this is a very important thing to remember, students, is that there was only one Korea. You have to remember that. Today, we, we think of North and South Korea. We think about it just normally. But uh, up until the separations in the 40s of the two Koreas, there was only one nation that was known as Korea. And um, so after the Korean War, I'm sorry, after the Second World War, uh, on April, 5th, April 15th, 1945, at the secession of hostilities and the independence of Korea, then the Korean masses returned from Japan. And we talked about that last week, how because of the occupation, uh, education in Korea was second rate. They couldn't get a good education. So they, anybody who wanted to go, and it was usually men, uh, had to go to Japan to get a good education. So. Um, they returned after the liberation, and they began opening their own schools. The question is, what was left? 
But because of the Allied bombing and the bombing of the communist forces, there was hardly a building standing in Seoul and almost nothing in North Korea, right? Uh, the Japanese, prior to that, during the occupation, tried to eliminate all vestiges of Korean culture. They eliminated their language, having them speak Japanese. They eliminated their Korean names. You had to have a Japanese name. They burned books. There were women who were used, to, excuse me if children were on, but women who were forced to become prostitutes for the, for the uh, Japanese forces. And to this day, they're known as comfort women, and they still demonstrate in front of the Japanese embassy today. Um, so there were no buildings standing. So for instance, uh, someone a couple of weeks ago asked about uh, Grandmaster Chun's teacher, who, as you know, was Chung Su Hung. And Chung Su Hung um, was born in the 1930. And uh, he signed on to the uh, railroad, the Manchurian Railroad, when he was 18. And he met Wang Qi, who came out to be the founder of the Mudaquan, right? And he was very faithful to the Mudaquan. He became one of the chief instructors of the Mudaquan for many, many years. Even during the war, he was practicing Tang Soo Do at that time, before the name Taekwondo came about. And he carried his uniform with him every day during the war. That's how, how uh, fastidious he was towards Taekwondo. But they had to practice in bombed out buildings. They had to practice on rooftops with no roof on it hardly. You would fall down several stories. They had to practice in forests or they had to practice in the ruins of buildings, right? There were very few structures left standing. So again, the formalized dojang as we know it today that we work so hard to create and make culturally correct really didn't exist. So as time went by, then things began, I use the word normalized, what a crazy word to use today, uh, to build certain dojangs. And the interesting thing about our school, and when I say our school, I'm not talking so much about Chosun, I'm talking about the Mudaquan. Um, it was known as the railroad dojang. Oh. Because what happened was Grandmaster Wang Qi worked for the railroad. Manchurian Railroad. And that's where he met Chung Su Hong, Grandmaster Chun's direct teacher. And they would practice in railroad stations. Huh. And as the trains progressed and as the work progressed, they would practice in various railroad stations. And that's how the name Railroad Dojang came about. Wow. So Dojangs, as we know them today, to answer your question, Christine, uh, is basically a relatively new uh, innovation. And when I say that, I'm talking probably of the 1950s on up. That was a very interesting. Long answer. Sorry, Chris. That, that, was, a, that was a great answer, though. I really appreciate it. And I can imagine how auspicious it was to have the master come back to see you again. And how that was, you really, you really wanted to show how much you've done since he left. Yes. It's, it, and you mentioned that he would give them homework. And I, I thought that th there's a lot of similarity because we kind of give homework here too with, with what we ex call it an academy. That's exactly right. Well put. Thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Academic component to it. No question. Absolutely. And I think that is why the number one reason, if you ask me why, and people have, why do we have so many high belts? Why do people stay here so much? And I think it's because of and you've used the word all the time, curriculum in an academic environment, which is really part, there's physical, there's academic, there's spiritual. You know, it really, it really covers the, the important parts of, of what makes someone whole and makes them grow. And, and I think that's the reason, at least in my opinion, it is. You know, that's a double-edged sword in a way, too. Uh, having the school now for almost 25 years, wow. uh, there are people who leave elementary school, there's people who leave high school, who leave college, and kiss it goodbye and say, oh, am I glad I'm done with this learning stuff. You know, I'll never have to write another essay. And Oh, it's, then they say, oh, I think I'm going to get involved in the martial arts. And they accidentally come to our school, and they're smacked right in the face with a big, overwhelming 
comprehensive curriculum. Right. And guess what? They got to write essays again. Yes, right? that's right. So it's a double-edged sword in the fact that those people who are thirsting for a comprehensive knowledge, right, of martial arts, authenticity in Taekwondo, will find Chosun to be very pleasing. Whereas people who want a simple workout, there's nothing wrong with that, uh, devoid of all the philosophy, devoid of the spiritual component, uh, will tend more towards a physical school than one that has a more comprehensive yeah. curriculum that, that satisfies the vast mosaic that is Taekwondo. And I might just say that in reading Grandmaster Chun's Advancing in Taekwondo, uh, I have uh, picked out certain sayings of his to put in the new book that I'm working on. Oh. And one of them is that, just like the Um Yang, if you do not study the philosophy of Taekwondo and just the physical, then you're only getting half of what you should be getting. That's a very good point. I, 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 thank you for that. Um, let me move on a little bit, because we spent quite a, that was quite an involved answer to a very involved question. So I, I thought that was an excellent discussion. So thank, thank you. you, sir. Um, I'm going to go uh, to back to Michelle Radakovitz, Instructor Radakovitz. Um, she asked some very interesting questions that I think people would really like to hear, and that's why we do this this uh, this particular show because people want to know underneath what's underneath what's underneath you know what's underneath Taekwondo what's underneath you know, a lot of the, the, you know, the origins and Shotokan, what's underneath, you know, you know, when you mentioned that you uh, talked with Kim Bak Man, Man, and, and, I mean, that must have been a fascinating discussion with, I mean, he's a legend. He I, mean, he's, I mean, he really is where a lot of these forms came from. When you, just to go, before I get to Michelle's questions, did you get the feeling that he was really deep and as in love with Taekwondo as you and Grandmaster Chun are? Um, I think that if you spoke to Grandmaster Gilhan Lee, if you spoke to Grandmaster Chun in, at any depth, if you spoke to Grandmaster Kim Bak Man or any of the great masters, you would be surprised at how nonchalantly they take Taekwondo. And what I mean by that, and don't misconstrue what I'm saying, because this is important. Taekwondo to them is their life. And it's been their life since pretty much they were children, right? So it's so much a part of their persona and their personality that to say, do you love Taekwondo would be like saying, well, do you love your life, you know? And um, uh, it was a, a good example of that is when we were out to dinner with uh, Grandmaster Lee uh, not long ago, in November, and we were at a local restaurant, and he asked us, how long do you think it takes me to do Kego Kiljung in my mind, in his mind? Mm. Right? And we said, oh, you know, maybe 30 seconds, 45 seconds. He goes, no, just like that. He goes, I could see the whole form from beginning to end just wow. like that. I know, you know. And so uh, being enamored with Taekwondo is different. The way I got involved, I, I'm pretty sure the way you can, of course, correct me if you're wrong, but the way you got involved, the way many of our students got involved, uh, it wasn't an intrinsic part of our culture. You know, an intrinsic part of our culture would be football or baseball. Uh, Taekwondo was like that in Korea, you know, but it also was looked upon uh, almost, uh, uh, you know, uh, the way baseball or football is looked upon here, you know. Uh, children will practice it, and then when they get to adulthood, they'll stop because it's a game for kids, you know. Right. And only few adults will continue and go on and become professionals, but when they become professionals, they become professionals. Yeah. You know? So it's a, it's a hard question to answer only because of the cultural disparities between Westerners and, and I'll even be more specific, Koreans, not just Asian people in general. You know. Great, thank you. So getting to some of Michelle's questions of coming under the covers a little bit, she asked, do you feel that your love for music has influenced or enhanced your 
Taekwondo training in any way or vice versa? Yes. <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> no, let me, let, me, let me say something about that. That's interesting. There are many masters who I know who are musicians. Oh. Many. I know uh, Master Mitchell, Grandmaster Mitchell Barron, who, right. was, who was really the first Taekwondoist in Orange County. Mm. Uh, has his school in Northeastern Martial Arts in Florida, you know, and he's a musician, you know. He's a guitarist. And uh, uh, many martial artists are, are musicians. And I'll say that uh, it's an interesting uh, juxtaposition because when you think of uh, music and you think of Taekwondo, they're both arts, right? Right, That's one yes. Thing. They both have their specific rhythms to them. Absolutely. You know, and by, by knowing music, I think that it's given me an advantage because I can apply rhythm to our forms. I can apply rhythm to our, our, our various movements that we do. And in the past, you know, wisdom is not something that comes to us. It's something that we cultivate through knowledge over time. Um, knowledge and wisdom are not necessarily the same thing. You know, it's right. using judgment on your knowledge that yes. gives you wisdom. That's right. So in the past, I've always tried to divorce whatever musical talents I've had, albeit small, you know, or large or whatever, away from my Taekwondo, two totally disparate things. And the older I get, the more I see how they can complement each other, you mm. know. But um, uh, I guess I, to, to answer your question outright, I do think that, uh, that music has helped me in my Taekwondo. And I think most martial artists who are musicians will tell you that. Do you think somebody who studies music, because there's a, a, a mental challenge to that, as well as being able to keep time really well and go to, you know, you know, four, four time, you know, one, two time, whatever the music happened to be, and be able to change the, that rhythm and, and be in time. Do you think that gives students an edge in Taekwondo? Sure, I think the same can be said for dance or gymnastics, you know, or dance because that's truly an art, you know. Uh, we have many young ladies and a few gentlemen who were dancers or are dancers still, and you could see that their flexibility and their oh, yes. ease and their uh, agility is uh, outpaced with their belt level, you know, it's far ahead of their belt level. So, yeah, any kind of physical motion, but particularly dance, I would have to say, would be the most uh, likely to add to your Taekwondo training. And don't forget what uh, uh, Grandmaster Sang Kim Shim always said in The Making of a Martial Artist, one of the greatest books you can read on martial arts. And he always said that the dancer is more akin to the martial artist than a boxer is. And one would think that the pugilist has more skill at fighting. But the dancer has more grace, more stamina, you know. And uh, so uh, being a dancer can probably really help being a good martial artist. And I bet you the reverse is true as well. Yes, I bet it would be. That, that's a really interesting perspective. Thank you. Michelle asks another question of why did Grandmaster Chun require the key op whom say, be pronounced ya. Is that more of a traditional sound, or where, where did that come from? Or is it individual? Yeah. Uh, where it came from, I'm not sure. But yes, it is a traditional way of doing it. And uh, quite honestly, Grandmaster Chun didn't just allocate the ya sound to forms, but all the time. Uh, but he said particularly forms, and I have to be honest with you in this. And I think he told me that because I didn't usually do that. Mm. I would usually go, ah, yeah, yeah, make a different sound, a personal key up, you know. But it, se it seemed to trouble him when I did the forms, and he made a point of saying, say, yeah, during huh. the forms, you know. Uh, but he truly wanted us to do it all the time. And I'll tell you, the only person I know who really uh, adhered to that in its fullness was someone who Grandmaster Chun respected very much and who respected Grandmaster Chun very much. Uh, and I wish he would be watching now. I'm sure he's not because he doesn't have the link. But uh, was uh, an old student of ours named John Jordan. 
Oh, the yes. Third, who was an excellent yes. photographer, a true artist. And um, he actually developed the first Chosun website and developed the first USDA website. And in doing so, became very close to Grandmaster Chun, you know. And so he was adamant about saying ya yeah, and everything that he did. Yes, he did. I did not know that's where it came from. So is the kya or kiap that we do, is that more of a kooky one type of, or where did it come from? The kiap, uh, to, to use, or ki you know, ki in, in Japanese, means spirit yell. Uh, you know, yes, right. So right. it's a manifestation of the spiritual energy, a vocalization of the spirit energy, right? Um, there are, you know, let me put it this way. In uh, yoga, in certain religions, in certain cultures, there are magic words, and they have to be said the right way to conjure up a certain right. image, right? Language is symbolic. Right? Words are symbols. That's what they, what they are. So uh, this is one of the reasons why I'm so adamant about using Korean terminology when we're doing our techniques. Saying, as you know, and I've said this many times, saying low block to a student, you know, having them do a low block, as opposed to saying arimaki. Instantly, that conjures up a different image in your head. And physically, and I've read an article about this, a clinical article, that would say that the symbology uh, 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 causes different actions in the brain through the neurons and what synapses and causes a different reaction, you know. So my guess is in creating the kiop, there was a magic word for it that should have been said properly, but it got corrupted over time, not just by Asians, but by Westerners as well, to the point where you would see movies like with Bruce Lee and then they go, ay and all that. Of course, people would mimic them. They would copy it. So that became the norm rather than what the magic word was meant to be. I think that we are fortunate in knowing that Grandmaster Chun knew what the magic word was and asked us to say, ya, yeah, because that's the way it was meant to be. Hmm. That reminds me of when we trained at the Kuki One. Remember the time that we got to watch the Korean national team work out that was that was a treat. That was just like you. If you want to see perfection in the martial arts, they were unbelievable. And when they did their breaking uh, practice, I noticed that they would key up before. That's correct. Mm -hmm. They broke the wood. That's right. And we kind of do it as we break, and. Is there a reason? Is one better? Is there, I mean, how do you see that? I could... That's a really good question. Thank you. Um, one of the reasons I enjoy uh, offering our martial pilgrimages to Korea is to remove provincial boundaries from our minds, right, and, and gain a world view of Taekwondo. Um, and many of the things that I've learned in Korea, I've imported back here to America, and I personally use them. And by virtue of me, my students tend to use them too. Um, when I do my breaks, in other words, my seventh down break, I did multiple bricks, right? I key up before the break. And that's because I think what we're trying to do, and if this board is on the metaphysical, obviously, is we're summoning that spiritual energy to give us the drive to, to penetrate these targets, right? Uh, if I do it on the break, I've wasted some time, you see, to call on that energy. Look, don't get me wrong. Don't misconstrue what I'm saying. I'm not saying that we're calling the spirits in to help us or anything like that. You can believe what you want as far as that goes, or the depth on that. But the body has a, a certain energy that we know is key. And to summon that energy and to summon it out of the reservoir of the Tanjan before the actual break is done, I think is a good idea. And you'll hear the blood-curdling screams of the Koreans as they do it. Yes. They have a different type of kiyop themselves. Quite do, yeah. Yeah, and uh, so I think as a practice, uh, and you can do it any way you want to do it, you know, I kiyop prior to the, to the break. It's funny because the last few times I tested, I tried that technique, and it seems to really work. Mm. 
at least for me. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's a personal thing. I it's agree. a personal thing. So I'm, I'm not suggesting everybody do it, but it's something to think about. Because everything... The important thing is to key up, though. Oh, absolutely. Right, right? That's the important yes. thing, right? Not keying up at a break uh, removes the drama from it right away, right? right? And will give you less power. How much less power, I can't be definitive about that. But I will tell you, it diminishes the break in the quality and aesthetically as well. Yes, no question about it. I, I, it, it really bothers me when people don't uh, I, do it. Everybody, it bothers everybody. Yeah, too. great. Um, so being that we were talking about the Kukiwan national, training with the Kukiwan and the national team, I, I've heard you told me and I've heard from other students and Michelle asks, why is the Cookie One facility look like it's been neglected in recent years? And are there political or financial reasons for that? Mm. Boy, these questions are great. Bob. I'm so glad you're asking them. Um, to me, the Cookie One is legendary. It's a cathedral. Yes. It's like the Vatican, as far as I'm concerned, or the Wailing Wall, you know? Yeah. And. Again, we've been very, very fortunate, not just to visit it once or twice, but to train there every time we go now, right? To step out on that sacred floor where forms were developed, kicks were developed, great championships were fought, right. you know? And to step uh, onto that environment is, is, is chilling, you know? It, it gives I you agree. such inspiration. Uh, several things have happened over the last 10 years or so, and one of them is the... Um, establishment of the Taekwondo Wan in Muju, South Korea. Uh, the Taekwondo Wan, uh, as those of you who know who have been there, is a vast, a multi-acre uh, uh, structure and uh, campus of various buildings and arenas that is literally out in the middle of nowhere in the, in the ski country of Korea. Very difficult to get to, by the way. but. Uh, over the course of 10 to 14 years, it was built. And one organization that helped that happen was the Taekwondo Promotion Foundation, right? the TPF. And many of our students have a Taekwondo One dough box, you know, uniforms. And if you look on the left breast, it says TPF, and that's the oh. Taekwondo Promotion uh, Foundation. And um, many of the things from the Kuki One museums have been moved there. It's a very modern facility. It houses many more dormitories and, and small dojangs throughout the facility. It has a museum. Um, it has a special section just for grandmasters where they can go in peace and meditate. It's quite a striking place. And it's very in inexpensive to go there and train, from what I understand. Um, it's my fear that the Taekwondo Wan may eclipse the Kuki Wan at some point. When, at, when I've asked Grandmaster Chun, he said no. When I asked Grandmaster Lee, uh, recently he became very quiet, you know, and uh, gave me the impression that that wouldn't happen. However, Grandmaster Gyohan Lee is, is one of the most uh, strongest supporters of the Kuki Wan, is also one of the highest ranking Grandmasters there. Yes. Outside of being uh, a vice president or president. He's unbelievable. One, it's in the most expensive real estate track yes. in Korea. Yes, like right? being in, in uh, midtown Korea. Manhattan. It is. In, <laughs> it, if I, next time I do a, a philosophy and history presentation when we can all get back to the school again, not a Pumse history night, but a general philosophy and history night of Taekwondo, I'll show you some new pictures I have, some new old photos I just received of the Kuki one oh. you know, when it was first built in 1972. And you look around the landscape, and there's nothing there. Today, those of you who have been there with us know what it looks like, right? right. So given the fact that it's in the, the uh, real estate is prime property, and what could be built there could be worth a lot more than the Kuki one, right? Sure. And given the fact that the Taekwondo Wan has now been built for the, uh, for the practice of Taekwondo, it's my feeling that the Kuki Wan is becoming uh, dusty with age, so to speak. And the last time we were there, and the time before it, 
it was not a shadow of itself, but you can see that it hasn't been taken very well care of. You know, uh, there were a sea of flags hanging from the ceiling that yeah. were just beautiful. Yes, and the place was pretty much spick and span uh, many of the times that we visited. But again, over the last two visits, I noticed that's been quite shabby. You know, so I don't want to predict that it's going to. That we've been told it's being reconstructed. That's why it's being renovated. Okay. You know? And I have no reason not to believe that, you know. Uh, but it's hard to believe that you can have two centers functioning in tandem with each other like that, uh, especially, again, given the real estate costs of the Kuki Wan. So I'm not, I'm not sure where it's going to go. I, I agree that the Kuki Wan is a sacred space. It's more than just historical. It's, it's, Correct. it's way more than just historical. Yes, I agree. Um, and, and as you said, you were exactly right about when you step onto that floor, you realize, wow, I am in the, the grand... The epicenter. Yeah. yeah. And, and, it, and it's, it's humbling, very humbling. And so, um, so we only have a couple minutes left. And being that we've been talking about the Kuki One, the worldwide organization, I was wondering if you would talk a little bit about the our, the United States and the U.S. Uh, Taekwondo Association. What is where is the status on that? What's coming up with that? Because you are, of course, the the head of that organization as well, which was a tremendous honor that Grandmaster Chun handed that to you. That was his baby. And yes. Yeah, uh, the story of the USCA is an interesting one. I think I mentioned it when uh, Grandmaster Chun went to Korea uh, to help Dr. Kim with the World Taekwondo Federation, and then he returned, and uh, the USTU, which then was the United States Taekwondo Union, Union. which you remember, and yes, you I remember do. of, as I was many, many years right. ago, uh, was the, was the uh, national governing body for Olympic Taekwondo in the United States even though Taekwondo was not an Olympic sport yet, right. not until 1988 and 2000 officially. But they saw it coming, so they started building organizations around the sport. Uh, Grandmaster Chung came back and was, uh, the story goes that he was supposed to ha handle that, to head that up, but it was all, the, the leadership role was already taken. So he founded in 1980 the USTA, and its mission is to promote the, uh, the uh, traditional and uh, evolving art of Taekwondo. Right. right? So his uh, slant, slant was more towards the tradition of Taekwondo. And you know, um, maybe next time we speak, I can talk more about this. The foundation of why I say that's true about how vehement he was about maintaining the tradition of Taekwondo. So as far as um, today's USTA, yes, Grandmaster Chun. Um, assigned me as the leadership role, the president and CEO of that, uh, shortly before he passed away. And it was with very mixed emotions that I accepted. I remember. Because I know there were senior students above me who could have yes, there taken were. it over. But he was adamant, saying, Doug, this is business. You are the businessman. I want you to take care of it. Well, obviously, there has been some discord because of that. Um, we won't get into that. And I feel very bad about that, by the way. But. Um, what we've done is we've recruited more schools now, here and across the world, around the world, schools that are now coming together since the USTA was fragmented somewhat as Grandmaster Chun's shifted, uh, focus shifted more to his center in, in, in New York City. Um, we've also published Twin Lian Magazine, which is a great yes. aspect. And that's the, every, every good academic organization should have a journal. You know, ask Dr. Dempster, he can tell you, that, or the American Medical Association Journal, or any journal, you know, of any sure. type of right. academy, right? So I knew immediately that we had to have a viable academic journal. So we came out with Quinlian, which is a, will be available next month uh, with uh, Grandmaster Heald Cho on the cover. Uh -huh. So we've gotten quality individuals to head up those covers as well. Uh, we've also done seminars, as you well know, the first World Taekwondo seminar, you know. We've done Pumse seminars. We've gathered individuals, and I just tested a USTA member today for Fifth On earlier this morning oh. uh, online, you know. 
so I feel that uh, the mission that Grandmaster Chun gave me, that was definitely not taken lightly. You know, I'm doing my best to make it my destiny to fulfill. Um, we're looking for more members. We're looking for new officers, you know, who will contribute to the art and the organization. And I can promise you that uh, going forward, uh, seeing how things change as far as the new world order goes, right, that will have an impact on the growth of the USPA. Sure. But my goal remains the same as it has for the last couple of years, and that's to uh, promote Grandmaster Chun's legacy, keep it alive, and also promote the USTA to promote uh, traditional Taekwondo. Kwon Jin, I can't thank you enough. I, with great gratitude, the insight that we got here this evening on all these different aspects of the art and uh, the origins and, and, and the tradition and, and where a lot of, lot of what we do, where, where it came from. Because that's important. It's important to know. And, I, and I, I, it's not often students get the opportunity when they practice and study the martial arts to get the richness of, of the origins and, and, and the history and, and, and why do we do certain things. So uh, thank you so very much for doing that for us tonight. And, I, I, ne and next week, I'd, I'd like to Look forward to some where is the USTA going and, and, and how you see its future. Because mm. I, I want to thank you, Master Adams, for thinking about this particular session, you know, this program. Uh, Master Adams has been a martial artist for many, many years, long before he became associated with Chosun. We knew each other in another uh, uh, mar martial arts school, and he was studying with Grandmaster Sun Duck Sun when he was a child. So he has a vast amount of knowledge in Taekwondo. Taekwondo, not just any martial arts. So uh, to have someone as knowledgeable as, as himself asking me questions is very, is very um, inspirational to me. And, you know, we've never done this before. So I'm very pleased that you suggested it. And I look forward to other programs Thank that you. we can do like this in the future, even when we go back to normal again, as far as our classes go. Uh, I think this is a very useful uh, forum to answer your questions. The only thing I ask you to do is please honor Master Adams by sending your questions in. Don't be shy. Uh, and I'll ask Grant, uh, Master Adams to tell you the address again. But be free with your questions. Be creative. Support this program and support the school through this very, very trying time. Thank you, Master Adams. Thank you, Kwon Jin. Please send me more questions. It's, it's so rare that you can get any Kwanjanim to answer questions as openly and honestly as our own master has doing for us. So I'd really like to hear your, your, what you're thinking and, and, and put it into a question format and, and getting, digging deeper into our art and into our school. And why do we do the things that we do? And where does it come from? All these things are really important for us to know. And that's what makes us different than the other schools. So thank you, everybody, for your questions. Thank you for watching. And come sahamida, Kwan Janim, for your time tonight. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Good night, everybody. See you tomorrow, 11.15.